We're here with Speaker Designate Kurt Zellers, and first off, Kurt, congratulations on the on the new title. No, oh, thank you, thank you uh, to, to you, but thanks to my colleagues, especially the House Republican Caucus. How does it feel? Uh, it's a little overwhelming right now. It's kind of like taking a drink out of a fire hydrant, but uh, you know we've. Uh, I think we've got such a great class of freshmen, uh, you know, at 33 strong, it's a huge class. Uh, but it's also, I mean, there's some remarkable people that are coming in here that uh, whether you're Democrat or Republican, it uh, doesn't matter, the body is going to be better for them being here with us. What is it that you bring to the speaker's chair? You know, I'd say probably a, a good blend, even though I come from, uh, you know, an expanding exurb or, you know, a growing suburb in Maple Grove. Uh, I grew up on a farm, so uh, that, you know we were having a discussion in there about metro rural, and as we always do in, in caucus, but also on the house floor. And you know, there's a lot of folks in there that were surprised to find out that the uh, town that my great grandfather helped found uh, is now gone. You know, the the elevator that he built and ran for decades uh, was burned down about five years ago. So, you know, it's uh, it's those un, you know kind of un maybe uh, talked about or undiscussed issues that some people don't understand that. Oh, well, he really does. And I could go out and drive a tractor right now for Paul Anderson or Torkelson. Uh, you know, Torkelson probably because he has John Deere, Anderson has his case. So, uh, you know, it's a big mix up there. It's like being a Viking and a Packer fan. Uh, but I think that's you know, you know, a perspective that I bring that maybe from being from a metropolitan area that I understand, you know, what it's like in, in rural Minnesota, what it means to help our agricultural ex economy expand. Uh, because there's a lot of opportunity there for us. And wasn't it your grandpa's plight that kind of got you involved in the whole political thing? Yeah, it was my, uh, you know, I actually got to ask this in a debate. Somebody said, well, why do you run? You know, what? and I, you know, I thought about it for me. I said, you know, my grandpa, when I uh, was a kid, and I get to drive around and go out and work in the field with him a lot. And uh, This was way, way long time ago, uh, you know, late 70s, early 80s. He uh, took me out and said, you know, see that uh, plot over there? You know, those cattails are now off limits. That's a wetland now. Uh, because somebody from the government came out here and said that that's a wetland. Now we can't farm it for the next three years. And what my grandpa explained to me, you know, as a kid, I didn't you know, okay, so you don't drive the tractor down there. But what my grandpa explained to me is, you know, Kurt, that's kids, you know, that's land that we can't produce grain on, that we can't feed kids, we can't grow sunflowers, wheat, barley, whatever it is. Uh, we're not going to be able to produce something for people to eat. He said, so it might be the government trying to do the right thing. He said, but it's a wet spring. That stuff would, uh, normally would drain off by, you know, June it'll be dry there. Said the government shouldn't be coming in here telling us what is and what isn't farmable. So that's for us to decide. We're the farmers; they're the government. And okay. it was, you know, early on, and I wasn't active in politics in high school, and then only after college I got real involved. But uh, looking back now, it's probably how, uh, you know, how uh, one of those things that you know, when your grandpa tells you something as a little boy, you always listen, and you'll, you hopefully you learn. Uh, something that really, uh, really stuck with me. Yeah. Now you worked for Senator Rod Graham's for a while, and then you were uh, in the uh, the ca House Caucus here for a while, but just yeah. a communications guy, and now. Here we are eight years later, and you're running the show. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and I, I've been in and out of politics a couple of times, uh, working in the private sector. You know, uh, worked for public relations firms uh, as a farm kid who can write a press release. Uh, you know, there's a couple of companies around that actually like that. So, uh, and, you know, we use my folks' as farm in a lot of cases with a couple of our clients to, uh, you know, take photos of crops and stuff and write uh, some of the uh, brochures and stuff. So, yeah, it was it was a great experience. Uh, you know, the things that I learned in politics to see how they convert over into the real world and you know when you're an account manager in a public relations firm uh, you work on billable hours so you got to account for every 15 minutes of your work uh, you know that's something we're not here in government we're not used to doing so it's a uh, it's a great experience it really gives you a good blend and uh, you know in a lot of cases I've also uh, you know I've suffered uh, with a lot of other Minnesotans when it comes to job loss you know uh, there's a really easy uh, way to find out when the economy starts going down or taking a downturn uh, public relations and marketing guys are always the first to go. So I actually, you know, went through that experience. And you know, when you go to your constituents and they say, "You don't know what it's like to lose your job," and I can say, "Yeah, I, I sure do." I mean, I know what it's like to have that conversation home with your family and say, "You know what, honey, we're not going to have an income. You know, this, we're going to have to make some decisions. Uh, you know, maybe we aren't going to be able to go to the movies. We'll go to Redbox. You know, we'll get microwave popcorn instead of going to a movie." But uh, I think it gives me a different perspective that you know a lot of folks around Minnesota feel as well. You mentioned your wife and you're married. You've got a couple of young kids. How does that all play into this, and how are you going to have time for them? Well, yeah, we've been doing a pretty good job so far. My wife's a public school teacher, so in the summers, uh, you know, she gets to spend time with uh, our kids in the summer. And uh, we work on quality, uh, you know, quality time always, but uh, you know, quantity is is where we'll maybe be at a little bit of a deficit now. But uh, we have great time together, and uh, the moments you do spend together are great. Um, we've always this has been either Democrat or Republican, a family-friendly legislature. You know, our kids always come down to the House floor. You know, my <laughs> Margaret Kelleher, when I got elected, uh, Speaker Kelleher actually had uh, my son and daughter, you know, bang the gavel to start the session when I first got sworn in. So 
uh, you know, we're going to make sure that it's family friendly as well. But we work on quality and maybe not necessarily quantity. And you mentioned, as we sit here today, it's a deer hunting opener. And when you said you'd rather almost be out in a field sometime, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah. Just to get away for a little bit? Yeah, you know, uh, it's uh, something that comes up afterwards. You know, uh, luckily the pheasants, uh, you know, the water doesn't, doesn't matter if lakes freeze for pheasant hunting. So uh, we will get out. I think it's a you know, good thing to be a uh, sound mind, but also a sound body. So we'll get out and do some hunting this fall. Uh, maybe some of my colleagues go with. But, uh, you know, do exactly what every other Minnesotan does. You know, we, that's why we live here. You know, we like that change of seasons, but we just love the being in the outdoors, whether it's, you know, going on the trails or going hunting or, you know, fall fishing. Uh, something I really enjoy, and it really brings good balance. To, you know, we're down here in the in locked in rooms for hours and hours on end. It's really good to get outside and uh, spend a little time in fresh air. Let's go back a few nights. Election night, you guys enter the night, you're 40 seats down, you come out of it with a 10 seat lead. What happened? Well, um, <laughs> good question. Uh, did you expect it? Uh, no, I mean, we didn't expect, uh, you know, some of the races were real, real surprises. But, you know, there were a lot of races where, you know, we, we've been on the other side of this for the last, you know, two elections, almost three elections, where it's 30 seats, it's 87, or, you know, 30 votes, it's 87 votes, it's 112 votes, yeah. where it just didn't quite go our way. Uh, I really give all the credit uh, to our candidates. We have, uh, in some cases, just phenomenal candidates that, you know, in the past have said no to us. We haven't actually have a candidate that uh, said no to, you know, easy to say no to me or to our, you know, our, any of our caucus members. But uh, when Governor Plenty called and asked him to run, he said, you know what, I don't think it's the right time for me. So we bring in our best closer and he still says no. But, uh, you know, one of our members, uh, uh, Tim Kelly, was able to go and talk to him. They have a similar business, could explain to him what, you know, could expect down here. So I, I really, it's, it's a, the quality of our candidates. We had folks that uh, two years ago said, look, I have a county commission term that I'm gonna, I promised for four years, I'd fulfill. Uh, I'm not gonna run this time, but I'll run in two years. They kept their commitment to their voters, but also kept their commitment to us as well. So I think that really, uh, by far and away, it's the quality of our candidates that they just fit the district maybe a little bit better than the incumbent or in some of the open seats or a better fit for that district than you know, maybe the, their Democrat opponent or independent opponent. And you look at your candidates, I think it was Rich Murray we were referencing that turned, even turned on Governor Pawlenty. But, yeah. but then you look at a guy like you've got a Brandon Peterson, I think he's like 24. Yeah. You know, you've got, you know, John Creeds, a lot of people know his story, you know, Iraq veteran and all that. But then you've got some people that have had, you know, some greater life experiences too. Yeah. I mean, how much is that going to add to this caucus? Well, I think that's, it's actually one of the most, one of probably the strongest part of our caucus is we have that great group. You know, uh, Dave Hancock, who's up in the far northwest corner of uh, Minnesota as well, uh, has been a business owner up in that area for literally for decades. You know, they, uh, there was a name, D&D uh, &D Dave, I think it was the name of his tire company. Or, you know, like everybody called him R&D Dave, that's what it was. Uh, and that was the name of his tire and repair company. So you, you have a pillar of the community like that. And we actually, in all honesty, went and sought those kind of folks out. You know, we went to the people that weren't the first to raise their hand. Uh, in fact, we're probably the first to say no or to say no, go to get somebody else. And uh, in that, you find those quality candidates. But uh, it is a, it's a fantastic diversity. Uh, you know, young families, you know, Brandon and his wife are expecting, uh, you know, Tim Sanders. We have folks on that end of the spectrum. And then we have folks like, you know, Dave Hancock and uh, Roger Crawford who have grandkids who have a different perspective on things. And that's what's going to make us just a phenomenal, it's going to make us a better body, uh, but it's also going to make us a better caucus. And to add two economists in one uh, fell swoop, that's phenomenal too. Uh, we had uh, both Kurt Bills and then uh, King Banyan, uh, two uh, you know very respected and very uh, well versed economists. You know when you when your car breaks down, you don't take it to your florist; you take it to a mechanic. Well, we're we're bringing two mechanics into the capital to help us fix the economy and help us turn things around. And you know you have some candidates you were able to knock off some long time long time powerful DFLers. I think of like a Lawrence Solberg and Al Junkie, a Bernie Leader. That really says something as well, doesn't it? Yeah, and it says something about the quality of the candidates too. You know, uh, Carolyn McElfactrick has been running, you know, this is her second time running. You learn a lot that first time that you look back and you think, oh, I really wish I would have done this or I would have went to that precinct last instead of this precinct. Uh, and then uh, Bruce Vogel, again, another local business owner. Uh, you know, I, when I was down uh, at uh, a family reunion down in, uh, in Green Lake, I, I talked to the local uh, resort owner and he said, oh yeah, he goes, Bruce is a great guy. He goes, I don't know why you guys didn't ask him to run earlier. Well, <laughs> it's just those kind of things that, you know, you, you have to catch those breaks or you have to have just the right candidate at just the right time. And Bruce is a, a you know, very well-known member and also, a, again, another pillar of his community, not only in his church, but in his you know, work in the city and work in the county. So you find those right races where they just fit right. And uh, in a lot of these cases, there were some really phenomenal uh, uh, candidates that pulled off just Herculean upsets. Is there any concern about some of these 
results being overturned. And I think there's what five within 130 votes, something like yeah, that. Yeah, I think I think there's maybe three to four that'll actually you know uh, trigger an automatic recount. Right. Um, you know, after the, the recount we had two years ago, I, you know, <laughs> I don't know. But usually with the way history goes, because we've been on the wrong side of this too many times, uh, whoever wins on election day, usually their margin only increases after the election. So I think that's, that's been our history, at least here in the House, because we've, like I said, we've <laughs> been on the other side of that too many times. We mentioned the recount, obviously, for the state's top official, Mark Dayton, Tom, Z or Tom Emmer, going to be involved in the recount. And obviously, you guys still think Emmer's going to come through. If he doesn't, how do you work with the Dayton administration? DFL are there, Republican House, Republican Senate? Yeah, well, and, and that's, you know, quite honestly, the shocking thing is the Republican House and Republican yeah. Senate. Uh, you know, quite honestly, we're going to work on the things that we agree on. And, you know, I take Senator Dayton, I take uh, my friend Tom Emmer uh, at his word, whether either one of them at it, whoever uh, prevails, that they want to work on whatever issue that will bring jobs back to the state, that will help our, our business owners here expand their and, and grow our economy. You know, not only uh, you know helping the taxpayers. You know, there's nothing better for somebody who's unemployed than a job. So, if Governor Dayton, if it is him, or Governor Emmer, both have said that that's going to be their number one focus. That's our focus as well. That's what our candidates. Uh, you know, we we talked about them today with you know. Here's what you, you know, remember. You have a, a scrapbook of your literature that you ran on. So when you go back home, you remember that it was about jobs, it was the economy, it was living within our means. Uh, and that's what we'll focus on. Uh, Senator Dayton has said that that's something that he uh, is focused solely on. Um, the tax issue is something we're going to just fundamentally disagree about. But, uh, you know, that, that's for later on in the process. It's safe to say tax increase might be dead on arrival. Uh, you know, I wouldn't say dead on arrival, I, but I would say that, uh, you know, I think the taxpayers of the state spoke very loudly. And uh, what we looked at, at least from the initial part of uh, Senator Dayton's plan on the campaign trail, uh, that's going to hit small business owners. People that filed as an S-Corp, an LLC, an LLP, they file their business and their income taxes together. You know, those folks can't afford another tax increase because it's not a matter of uh, taking a little bit less money out of their pocket or their checkbook. They're looking at taking away a job. They're looking at selling off a piece of equipment. They're looking at having to shut their business down and move to another state. So I, I just think that's a, uh, you know, the, the, the voters have made that decision. Uh, I think that's where we'll stand as well. If we can help expand the economy, it's going to be better for us all in the long run. You know, we're looking roughly a six billion dollar deficit going into the biennium, and of course, there's a forecast yet to come here in early December. But is there anything that Republican caucus will keep off limits, like Governor Plenty did with like K-12 and the veterans? Sure, sure. Uh, K-12 absolutely. Our developmentally disabled, those that are in nursing homes, you know, protecting and providing for our most vulnerable in society has always been our priorities. It's, you know, we've we've worked on that as a caucus bipartisanly with the governor's office. Uh, and then it's going to be about prior prioritization. You know, if, uh, as you just said, there's going to be that forecast coming in November. Uh, what we've seen so far is that, you know, if the economy kind of clunks along like it has, and we've actually seen a slight uptick here in Minnesota, uh, we're going to collect $33 billion in the next biennium. We've spent $30 billion this time. So we're going to have more money to spend, about 78% uh, on, you know, just getting real technical. Uh, so we're going to have a lot more money to spend this next time. Where you get into that budget deficit is if you want to go back to the old spending levels. And, you know, I don't think there's a business owner in the state says that he's back, you know, he or she are spending at 2009 or 2010 levels. Almost everybody's back to 2002 or 2003 levels. So it's going to be about prioritization. We're going to take care of, as you said, uh, education, but also our develop developmentally disabled, those that can't provide for themselves in nursing homes. And then first and foremost, though, we're going to make sure people are not only safe in their homes, but that they feel secure. It's one thing to be safe to get in, lock your doors, and lock everything outside, but we want you to feel secure while you're in your home as well. I think your thoughts, maybe a couple other issues. Bonding bill, potentially, I know Republicans generally seek less than the DFL does. Any thoughts this early on something like that? You know, I, I think it's real, real important, especially after what we've seen at the federal government level with, uh, you know, even President Obama admitting that some of these shovel-ready products weren't necessarily shovel-ready. You know, they may have been shovel-handy, you know, but not shovel-ready. So, and what we saw when we went through the bonding bill last spring was that there were a lot of unlet bonds. So we've approved the project. We said, here's how much you can get. Now, you know, bring us back the plans. We'll give you the money. There's a lot of, of unspent money out there. So before we go out and make future commitments, and if after a year or two years you haven't been able to get your project up and running and get the matching funds you need, you know, maybe it's not the right project then. So we pull back those projects that aren't, have not been started yet before we start with new projects. I think that'd be our first place to start. But uh, again, that's, uh, you know, first you got to get an idea of what's out there and then also get an idea of what the federal government is going to do too. What about gambling revenues? We've heard 
Dick Day has been saying it's, you know, it was a great election for the Racino, for example, and others have said, you know, slots here and there. Any thoughts on that? Well, you know, I think that it's also up to the two governor candidates, you know, as well. I think Senator Dayton said he's in favor of it. I don't, I'm not sure where, you know, Tom Emmer has been, you know, on, on the issue as a whole. But uh, we don't see uh, our problem down here as a revenue problem. We see it as a spending problem. So if we live within our means, we're not going to need to have a whole bunch of new revenue. Now, uh, if there are priorities in, uh, in government that aren't being funded at the current levels, I mean, that's something for the governor to make a decision on. But uh, we're focused on jobs and the economy. And if it's not going to do something to help our business owners to get government off their backs, out of their pockets, and out of their way, uh, you know, that's going to be our number one priority. That's what we're going to start with. And we'll get to some of these other things later on. Yeah. We are in football season. Does the Viking Stadium fit into that whole jobs mentality? Well, I, I think so. Uh, e even if, uh, you know, we're minus a coach or a couple of <laughs> players here and there, I, uh, no, I'm not going to, you know, as a former co football coach myself and college football player, I, I won't make any judgments on the team, but I'm just saying, you got a receiver that, you know. <laughs> uh, but it's something that, you know, we've, uh, you know, we worked in a bipartisan way last uh, uh, session with uh, Representative Atkins and Hoppy and Lanning, you know, a lot of folks from both sides of the aisle looking at a solution. So I do think so, um, but again, we're going to have to balance the budget first and foremost. We're going to have to look to help get our economy going again. Uh, but you can see from uh, what the Gopher Stadium and what the Twins uh, new stadium produced when it came to uh, not only good private sector jobs, but you know some union jobs as well. And uh, we, we think another great way to do that is also with the nuclear moratorium, you know, lifting that just so that we can see if it's possible. We don't, we're not going to build through my island tomorrow, but we just need to see if it's possible. And then look at, there's some examples around the country where this has started. And that is a, that is a real long-term jobs program that would be something that we absolutely should be looking at this year. Final one I'll ask is on, on like the social issues. We saw the anti-gay marriage folks have come out and said, "Oh, this is a great election for us as well." And now we're going to get this thing on the ballot for 2012. And is the social issues something to, that are going to be addressed, or will be you know right behind jobs in the economy or anything? You know, uh, again, jobs in the economy. I mean, you hate to sound like a, a broken record here, but you know, if you if that is something you care about, if it's something you want to work through in your church or in your synagogue or in your mosque. Uh, you can't get there if you don't have a job. It's hard to buy a car if you don't have a job. It's hard to be a part of an organization. It's hard to tithe to your church or your whatever your <laughs> your religious uh, organization is if you don't have a job. So that's our for, first and foremost focus. It has been for our candidates out on the campaign trail. I think that's what the voters responded to. You know, that's what it, when you can tell with our candidates when that was their message. Uh, when it got when their opponents started going after them on personal attacks, uh, that's where a lot of these races broke. So. Uh, that's our first and foremost focus. You know, we want to make sure that Minnesota is competitive. I'd love to run an ad in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, saying, "Come on back to Minnesota. We're open for business. We're fixing things here. We're not quite there yet, but come on back. Give us a look." Or then, if we get going really go get ahead of steam, we'll go start running some ads in Texas, saying, "Sure, you can, you know, be down here and not have property or you don't have income taxes, but Minnesota is a great opportunity." So that's going to be our focus. Uh, it always has been, and it's something that we think. Uh, is a first priority for the vast, vast majority of not only Republican voters, independent voters, but Democrat voters. So before too long, we'll have Kurt Zellers on the radio saying, come on back from Sioux Falls to, <laughs> to go against their tourism guy that we hear all the time. You bet. Uh, Amy Koch and I and uh, Governor Emmer, Governor Dayton, will have a choir on there, and we'll be running ads in Sioux Falls saying, uh, that development director has been lying to you. Come on back. We've got a great <laughs> economy here in Minnesota. Uh, you know, Come check us out, and while you're here, go to a Twins game or uh, see a Vikings game if sure. you can stomach it. You mentioned Amy Koch. She was just named the Senate Majority Leader, I think it was yesterday. Michelle Fishbox is going to be the Senate President now. How well do you work with those two? Oh, great. I mean, you know, Dave Senjiman and I worked well together as, you know, as a uh, you know, minority team. Uh, Amy's been fantastic. We crossed paths many, many times on the campaign trail uh, on some of the fly-arounds as well when we were, uh, you know, going from city to city to city. Uh, Amy is a, she's a great friend. She is a really good strategist. Sorry, George Bush. <laughs> Uh, but no, she's got a, a, not only does she have a, a good sense for metro versus ur urban, uh, you know, those the kind of traditional splits, uh, but Amy's, uh, she is, she's a great strategic thinking mind, but she also understands that balance we need to bring, and also living within her means, and I, I'm real excited to work with Amy. She's a, a good friend, and she's, uh, like I said, she's, uh, she's got a great job ahead of her. I mean, no, no pressure, first time in 30 plus years, but hey, <laughs> I think she's up to the task. I think she'll do a great job, and I'm very proud to have her uh, as a, as a good team working together. I, th I really think we're going to do a lot of good things to get Minnesota moving forward again, get our economy back on, the, on track, and really start to lead the recovery, not just you know, wait for it with like everybody else. You're going to replace Margaret Anderson Keller as the House Speaker. Are there things from Margaret that you learned that you can take 
when you take over the gavel? Absolutely. Uh, one of the things we, uh, we learned real uh, fast and uh, I, I, something that I'm going to absolutely, uh, one of the first things we do is, uh, is make sure that to allow the minority as much time as they want for amendments, for speeches, to make their point. I mean, that's why people put uh, Democrats and Republicans in charge. Uh, they don't want everybody to get along. You know, unicamerals for Nebraska, not for Minnesota. We like a good spirited debate, and that's why democracy is, the, you know, the, this democracy that we have here in the country, but also in Minnesota, is a, it, it's the best thing in the world. Sure, it's messy and it's ugly, and sometimes it's not a tickle fight. Somebody's going to get a bloody nose every so often, but we're going to absolutely allow those folks to have as much time, as much uh, that they need to make their points, to make their arguments. We think we can, uh, you know, absolutely. Uh, have that discussion and at the end of the day will prevail but you know, that's the first and foremost thing uh, that we think and then uh, probably doing like a lot of business owners across the state have had to do families have had to do we're going to streamline government and that starts right here in our own backyard we're not going to have as many committees we're not going to be here as many days you know taking up time taking up staff time you know wasting paper I know it sounds kind of trivial but you know every time we're here in a committee hearing there's a lot of paper that gets used but a lot of staff time that gets used uh, we think we can be a little more efficient and effective in the way we run government. Any feelings on what the committee number is going to be sitting at once all is said and done? I think we think we're close to what 40 with the DFL with subcommittees and divisions and all that. Yeah. I think out of the 87 members, 83 of them had a gavel or some sort of chair or commission. So, you know, I'm going to work really closely with Amy. You know, we had to. It's all kind of happened. You know, in the last couple of days here. Yeah. So we know who the leaders are, but um, it, it is a wonderful opportunity for us, uh, you know, for Amy and I to get together with Matt and, uh, you know, whoever their deputy leader is going to be and line up those committees. And it was something that I actually, you know, had, had proposed to Senator Pogamiller and, you know, Senator Senjum in the past that, you know, why do we have this, you know, looks like a plate of spaghetti spilled out on the table. Why don't we line them up? You know, tax committee and tax committee, jobs and jobs, you, you know, education and education. So, It'll be a great opportunity for us, and Amy and Matt and I are actually going to sit down this afternoon to start that process. Uh, it's a you know beautiful Saturday afternoon outside, but but we've got work to do. Uh, there's people that don't have jobs in Minnesota, and it's our responsibility to try to help them get back to work. So we're going to sit down. We'll get that, that process laid out so that we have a a good idea as to you know how they can match up, and then start the hearings and be very aggressive with our schedule as well. We asked uh, we met with Representative Teeson yesterday, and we had, we were telling him. And, one of the things I liked about him and you, you both seem to be guys that you don't care what side of the aisle a good idea comes from. If right. it's a good idea, let's go forward. Yeah. I mean, how much is that going to help in 2011, 2012? Oh, I, I think it'll be, it really is going to be critical. I, I think the voters have given everybody kind of, uh, you know, they gave the president his due. Now they're going to give us a shot, uh, both state here in Minnesota, but also on the national level. Uh, and I think it's, you know, it's a probationary period. I, that's the way I see it. Uh, we're going to, we ran on what we uh, would do if we got in, in, you know, we were put in charge. We're going to live by exactly what we said we were going to do. So I think a good idea, I mean, I've been very lucky. Um, Joe Atkins was the uh, chair of Commerce Committee. I was the minority lead on that. Uh, when we, when the roles were reversed and uh, he was the minority lead and we were in the majority, uh, both Joe and I, we had an A to Z and Z to A bills. So when you actually can go back and say to somebody, hey, remember we sponsored that bill together? I think actions speak a lot louder than words. So, you know, working together on those bills, if it's a good idea, if it's something that's going to, again, help move our economy forward, help us, you know, be more productive here in Minnesota, absolutely in favor of it. Uh, n our party, nor theirs, nor the independent party has exclusive rights and good ideas here in the state. So we really will work together, uh, you know, no matter whose idea it is, and, and bring that to the forefront. And then and pass it first and foremost, not wait for it to, you know, make its way through this, you know, uh, you know, labyrinth of committees and hearings and subcommittees. You know, we're going to make it an easy process, especially not for us, but also for the voters. You know, the average Minnesotan that wants to come down here and watch how their government works, we want to make sure it's an easy process. You know, yeah, there's places, you know, it's hard to find an office, but, you know, you should know that if you're coming down here to see a public safety bill, you know where the public safety committee meets and when it meets. So, you know, from the voters of the state as well, and so they got an idea of whether, you know, they want to come down here. And we've seen a pretty uh, intense move to get involved in what your government's doing. So we're going to make it really easy for folks to come down and uh, be a part of their government. Final question I've got for you. You guys are in charge. Redistricting is coming up. What does that mean for the Republicans? Well, it, it's a huge responsibility, especially, you know, we were, uh, you know, I think we are pretty darn close to losing a congressional seat. I think we're going to be okay now. I think we're going to actually have a... Uh, an opportunity to keep our seats and then to you know redraw them um, you know in, in a lot of cases my seatmate uh, representative Pepin out in Maple Grove uh, she's got part of Maple Grove Rogers Corcoran Hassan 
she had, I think, almost 30,000 people vote for her alone. Our districts are only supposed to be 35,000 <laughs> people combined. So you, know, you got to figure that's a lot of people that, you know, these grow districts grow so fast, you know, and, and so big that it, it's going to be good and it's going to bring some continuity. So when folks look at that, and it, it'll make it a little easier to have your government closer to you. So that's going to be our first and foremost focus when it comes to redistricting, making sure that, you know, these sizes are a lot more proportional so that you don't have, you know, these huge swings where somebody's got 28,000 and somebody's got 40. To, you know, 40, 42,000 in their district. Unfortunately, for those in greater Minnesota, it might mean greater geographic size. Right, and th and that's something that you know, in looking at too. You know, do you run them north, south, east, west? You know, can you make it a bigger square versus a rectangle? Uh, those are things that we're going to be very, uh, very cognizant of as well, because we want to make sure that it's easy for you to serve your constituents, so you don't have to grow. Uh, I think uh, Dan Fabian, our incoming member from 1A said it's about 125 miles from one end to the other in his district. Well, let's make that a square instead of a rectangle, but you know, sometimes that's easier said than done, too. Sure. As always, I'd like to give you a final opportunity if there's anything else you'd like to add. No, I don't think so. I think it works. Right. Well, Speaker-designate Kurt Zellers, we thank you for your time, and best of luck in the upcoming session. I appreciate it. Thanks for the time, too.